Uh, one of my uh, favourite theme tunes, which I always find in a way comforting and familiar, perhaps because it's been played for six days a week uh, for the last 72 years on BBC Radio 4. It's titled Barwick Green. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Archers, the archers, yeah. How many has actually listened to it? You're a younger generation, yeah. At the first service, there were quite a few more, but hey. Yeah, do you remember the music? Da 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's subtitled, An Everyday Story of Country Folk. And that's what the Book of Ruth, what Adam read earlier, can be called. For plain and simple, that's just what it is, an everyday story of country folk. It deals with an ordinary family, dealing with all what families come across at some point. This applies to us all, folks. Loss and the struggles of life. For me, there's no deep theological message nor hidden message in it. But as I get older, I find when I'm reading my Bible, sometimes... Uh, too much thinking can get into the way of what the true Bible is about. And of course, in the New Testament, that's Jesus. In the Old Testament, it's God, one of the same. And there's an old saying, too much analysis causes paralysis. We can think too much about things. It reminds me of an aged... Uh, Professor, uh, professor of theology, uh, theolo theology who was asked to give a talk uh, to students on a difficult passage from the Old Testament and it was in the days when professors used to sit on the st uh, stage. This guy was a pipe smoking professor and this one student put his hand up and he asked the question can the Bible be trusted? The professor sat there in his comfy chair, took out his pipe, put it in his mouth, puffed on it, and thanked, and, and, and just thought for a while. And he looked at the student and said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that's what the book of Ruth is about, love, pure and simple. No villains in it, just good people trying to get through life. Quite simple, except God is in it from start to finish and beyond. And when I say in it, I don't mean in a personal way, a manifestation like the burning bush, but he's in it through the people that are in it. Their lives are wrapped up in it and he's wrapped up in them he's just like the director of the archers he's behind the scenes working out the storyline of his cast of characters I'm grateful uh, I don't know if he's still here Richard Jobs for his systematic overview of uh, Ruth uh, last week last, e uh, last Sunday evening and for Sue Ward uh, for her introducing us to the three main characters last Sunday of Naomi, Arthur and of course Ruth and the beginning of the storyline that they found themselves in. So that was last week, that was chapter one. Adam's just read chapter two. So the story moves on. The three have now become two. Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth and they've moved on They've moved on to Jerusalem, uh, sorry, Bethlehem. And this is where the story begins to get very interesting. And perhaps we're moving from the Archer's territory more into Emmerdale Farm as the love interest enters the story in the shape of Boaz, a rich farmer. He owned land and employed people to help him on the land. And more importantly, he was a close relative of Naomi's. 
Now, here's the thing. Ruth wasn't aware of this connection. She just wanted to support a mother-in-law by working hard for them both. And it would seem by chance, and I put a question mark against that, she ended up working in a field belonging to Boaz. And that's when Boaz first set his eyes upon her. And at this point, I'm tempted to say, say no more. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> For we've heard that Boaz took a special interest in this young, distant relative. Kim shared with him, I'm sorry Kim, I'm not taking it away from what you're going to talk about next week. I didn't realise this, that uh, at that stage, Naomi may have been about 40 years of age. And Boaz, am I right Kim? Ruth, Ruth sorry. Boaz was 80. So big age gap. Anybody listening to news, you'll see that Buzz Aldrin's just got married again. 93 to a 60 year old. Hope for a song. Pardon? It's what? It was his fourth marriage. Yeah, as well. I know. <laughs> I am now. <laughs> so he was interested in it. And, and, and uh, mother in law uh, Naomi uh, said, you know, the young distant relative well, make sure she was cared for. She took a special interest. Uh, in her, so Naomi said, "You know, go for it, go for it. You you go with Boaz. You work for him, because he'll care for you. His servants and workers will look after you." And he even invited her uh, to eat with him. And all this, and she was a foreigner too. When Ruth told Naomi where she had uh, where she'd been working. And how she'd found favour with Boaz, the rich relative. Knowing me, like all good mothers-in-law, said, go for it, or words to that effect. For she knew Ruth would be safe and in no danger. And perhaps, well, well, I'll leave that till next week, till uh, Kim talks about the next chapter in the story. So the point is, okay, I've I've portrayed this story as a bit of a soap opera, which it isn't. For we all know that like our government, soaps don't do God. Whereas the book of Ruth is full of God. It brings together God and the main characters in the love story of Ruth. What Adam spoke there, this is the language that uh, these main characters were like immersed in. Firstly, Boaz greeting the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The harvesters call back. The Lord bless you. Boaz speaking to Ruth. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Naomi talking to Ruth. Blessed be the man who took notice of you. The Lord bless him. This language, this was the people who not only knew God, but acknowledged him in front of others. And I ask you this, and I'm talking to myself here, how many times do you acknowledge God in front of others in your general conversation? Think about it. You know, I gave that thank you earlier on and I meant it for my daughter Sally. And I acknowledge God in it. Not only do I acknowledge him in the good times, like birthdays, and we all have good times. The hard thing to grasp, folks, is when it's not the good times. Like Naomi and Ruth, they suffered loss. You know, and we'll all go through it. Some of us have already, you know, suffered it. And that's, when we acknowledge God. Whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels. 
One of my favorite verses from the Bible, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. Lord, I give you thanks. I praise you for who you are. In whatever situation they found themselves, good and not so good, Naomi and Ruth faced it with palms open to God. In other words, they were receptive to receive from him. I take quite a few funerals. I've taken two this week. This Bible verse, I always say, usually as I came, come in before the coffin, had had to grasp for the family. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hard to say when you've just lost someone. But what it is, it's a faith. It's a faith, folks, that's being exercised in the realities of life, all what we're going through. And that faith is made alive in Ruth and Naomi and Boaz through the providence of God. Now you'll be hard pressed to find the word providence in the Bible along with another word that is not in the Bible and would you believe that word is bridge. You'll be hard find to press the word providence in the Bible so what does it mean in a Christian perspective? The prophet Jeremiah sums it up in these words and this applies to us all if we believe. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, and it doesn't always mean money, to prosper you. He's prospered myself and Pauline with a family. To prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I'll just divert a little bit from that. When I say prosper you and I do mean it and believe it and acknowledge God in it. My family, I worked out as we were going to see uh, with Sally for uh, the, the get together when Sally was born our family comprised of 19 members, close family close family it now stands at nearly 40 of us. The Lord has prospered and taken away. The Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. Because trans going from 19 to 40, we've lost some dear members of our family, not least our parents. So, so the gospel reading that I read from Luke starts with two believers walking and talking, and the resurrected Jesus joins them and walks with them. And we are like those two believers. We are in the world walking and talking and getting on with our lives. But Jesus is there walking with us. People ask, even when they lose loved ones, cry out to God, why God? Why is... Why is my dad being taken from me. Why has my husband, my wife been taken from me? It, it, it's just hard. But, you know, God is there. Where's God when we have the tragedy? Where's Jesus? He's on the cross, hung on the cross. And he has plans for us, like the plans he had for Ruth. She found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. Remember I said the question mark behind it? Is that coincidence? Is it a God incident? Or is it God's providence? Kim and Rob over the next two weeks will be completing the whole story of Ruth. Only then will we see how the full providence of God has worked out in the lives of Naomi Ruth and Boaz. A whole picture which in many ways mirrors the lives of us all here. 
all what we're going through, you might think, folks, this is it. There's a lot more to come. And I have to say, the best is yet to come. But there will be some not so good things happening. So God will be in it as, as God's in our story. Ruth's story is our story and God is in it from our very beginning to our end on this earth. And here's the important bit, to our end on this earth and beyond to eternal life. And that is based on our faith in the gospel. The life, desert, uh, death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We sometimes have communion at this service. Drink the cup, we eat the wafer. Drink the cup, have eternal life. I finish with these words from a chap called Abraham Kuyper. You've probably never heard of him. He was the Prime Minister of the Netherlands in the late 1800s. He was also an intellectual he was also a professor of theology. Whether he smoked a pipe, I don't know. And this is what he said. There is not an inch in the whole area of human existence of which Christ, the sovereign of all, does not cry out, it is mine. That from him... And through him and in him are all things. All events in this world, all events in our lives, apparent things or not. Coincidences and chances and all the change we go through are in the hands of God. What's that song? The whole world in his hands. God has a purpose for his world, not our world, it's his world. And that more importantly, he has a purpose for each one of us here today. You may not be thinking it, but he has. But what you've got to remember, good or bad, good or not so good. The thing is, is to grasp the not so good. That's when you praise the Lord and acknowledge him. Amen.